The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection with Al Payne. Our guest is Robin McCabe, concert pianist and professor of music at the University of Washington. People talk about the interpretation of music. What does that mean? It's a good question, a big one. First of all, interpretation is your ability to read the score and hopefully transmit the composer's wishes. Uh, but beyond that, you get to a kind of dangerous word because it's a, a, a dangerous word, taste. And that is a lot of interpretation. I think taste is an acquired art, just as your taste for uh, caviar or, or scotch. But it's an acquired thing which comes from your experience. Is it uh, subjective, objective? No, it's not. It's neither nor. It's both. It has to have the cold, objective eye so that you see what's written in the music and you relate one element to another. It also has to be subjective because it has to be emotional, your emotional participation. Mm -hmm. So it's fair to say that interpretation is technique plus. Why not? Well, that's good. I think that's good. All right. The first piece you're going to play is called... Well, this uh, is a wonderful piece. I've excerpted with apologies to a purist uh, from a large piece. I think Mussorgsky would rather have his music played than not. So I've taken three portraits from his very famous pictures at an exhibition. And this is piano music, which is stunning uh, in that it was written in the 1850s, 1860s, and it has a very forward-looking uh, concept, the concept of realism. And Mussorgsky and his buddies were determined to uh, champion a kind of art which, which didn't, uh, didn't project beauty in the classical sense. You know, in the Greek sense, beauty was harmony, proportion, and symmetry, everything in its place. This is the real people, the Russian people, the poor, um, portrayed. And Mussorgsky felt that art should, above all, depict graphically and communicate. How do you interpret realism? Well, with something like the Mussorgsky pictures, you first of all take the picture itself, the image. And the first one that I'll play for you is a, a little portrait called uh, the Tuileries, little children quarreling in the garden. And with one little cajoling figure, this little falling figure, the composer represents this kind of pleading um, tone in, in a, a little children's chant. And the fracas grows and it bursts up and then it dissipates. Fine. Tell us about the second part, the third part, and then let's do it. All right. And the second picture, the ballet of the unhatched chicks in their shells, little chickens dancing around uh, on little eggshells trooping around. And the last portrait is the finale of this suite, the Great Gate of Kiev. Uh, and this is a kind of musical portrait of a, a thousand years of Tsardom, everything that was holy about Mother Russia. You hear chanting priests and a broad theme, and the bell in the cupola of the tower begins to toll bigger and bigger, and in every way it's kind of a, a nationalistic uh, portrait. So uh, these are three excerpts from the pictures at an exhibition. Do it. Thank you. 
We talk about interpretation as being technique plus, with the plus being emotion. What kind of emotion do you feel when you play a piece like you just played? Every kind. Uh, you have to have the gamut of your emotions has to be mm. huge because there's every kind of thing in here from fervor and ardor to religious kind of uh, feeling. Um, and, and I think, again, technique and control is having the freedom mentally and emotionally to let all those things be happening while just the notes are happening. Can you practice emotion? No. No. Again, it's, it's a, a summation of what you are and what life has allowed you to become or what you have come in contact with in your, in your life. I think that, that teaching, basically, uh, for me, uh, to be a good teacher is to be able to let your own experience somehow uh, be accessible to the student without denying him his own development. That's, that's the big question. How do you ask the right questions so that the student begins to be aware of the many possibilities in, in the music? And not just the notes, but all the relationships that make the music work, all the interplay, um, the tension and the resolution and the phrases. Um, let me give you an example. I think that would be better. This is a little excerpt from a Chopin ballade, uh, a seemingly simple excerpt with, with not too many uh, notes. Let me play it for you first and then we, we might discuss it. All right, so not many notes, but uh, let's just examine all the possibilities, all the variables that go into interpreting this, all the choices that I have to make. But there must be an infinite set of choices. There are. And of course, the more that you're aware of, uh, the more you're challenged mm. by having to do it. But again, if the student becomes aware of this, it, it gradually assimilates, I think, into his playing so that you don't have to point out this in the score to him and this in the score and this. They learn how to read the score, the clues in the score. Uh, for instance, what do I do with this melody? Do I highlight? the note by playing it louder, or do I highlight it by suddenly changing the color and playing it softer? Now here we have something in music that we call a sequence. Now that means that the music sort of repeats itself, different notes but the same pattern. Now I've got lots of choices with that sequence. I can let the music sort of go, as I just did for you, or I can subtly break each member of the sequence, and that'll make the music seem perhaps a little held back, but maybe a little more persuasive. And you might say to me, but gee, that seems a little labored. That seems like you're cutting it up too much. So I have to make that choice. Earlier today, we videotaped you teaching a student. Tell us about her. Yes, Marianne Gossen. Uh, Marianne is very young, um, just 17. I've had her a year and a half. And uh, she, I think, personifies everything I think is good about a young American talent. Uh, she's good at many things. Um, she takes criticism beautifully. Uh, and there's a lot of energy and there's a lot of uh, psychic health in her which I think comes through in what she's trying to do and that again is a result of her uh, upbringing I think her background her family uh, again we go to this idea of uh, the art in you being a really total package and what a responsibility to teach someone like that because you want to let the package open naturally and nicely without interfering with the ribbon too much um, so it's a nice challenge for me Great. Let's take a look at. Okay. Okay. Let's let's run the first section of the scherzo. How about that? Okay.
that's a big improvement. Let's look at a little bit about this first section, how about here. Um, I have the feeling still, although it's the energy is really there, that there's too many peaks that are the same. Mm -hmm. Now, what would you say, what was the first arrival point for you, the biggest arrival point? Oh, yeah. Right, the, the, really the high B, you know. So when you get up there, you should just be so pr emphatic about it that it's the biggest sound that we've made, the biggest crescendo. Now, how can you, what can we do to get a better crescendo here? Maybe if I started quieter. Right, okay, let's try that again, from, right from here still. Make sure you come down, the lower you start the crescendo, the more illusion you can make a big sound. Okay, let's go from the first chords. Let's try the first chords. much again. The third one is still not special enough, you see. Um, we, we were talking about how you described this music before, uh, and you had some interesting ideas, but that you use the word spinning, you yeah. know. It should, it's almost like the, the tumble-dry cycle on the washer, you know. You should feel like you're inside that washing machine just spinning around. So the last one has to be bigger. Let's try it again from the... Yeah. dramatic, deeper, deeper sound, those, the project, yeah, that's right, bottom of the key, go to the bottom of the key, sound very good sound okay now so arrival points more major ones make sure that that one is so much bigger than the rest of them that we feel it's a real paragraph um, now I want to look at your arm here at the climax here you did very well we want to figure out how to get a little more sound out of you do I need to be accenting these notes or sure Bo actually both with with your arm give an arm sort of an arm motion to both of them that's where I feel you a little weak need here could we try someplace where's an easy place for you to go Anywhere in here? Yeah. Sure, here. Yeah. Okay. Close your arm from above. From above. That's it. Keep going. Good. Good. opera, you know? That's good. Okay, that's great. Well, that's peaking really well, you know? Very good. Okay. How do you hold a student up to a set standard? Is it difficult not to hold that student up to your own standard? Well, I think you have to, of course, keep in mind what you infer as the capacity of the student at any time. Uh, I don't expect them all to do what I do. Certainly, I don't want them to all be little clones of me, although that's sort of a tempting fantasy, isn't it, to turn mm -hmm. them all into. But you, you try to help them be their own best selves, and their capacity becomes evident and you just try to increase it so no I don't have a set thing where if I think if one student won't do a certain piece by the end of the year no it, that's too rigid how do you hold yourself up to your own standard do you have a standard for yourself I surely do absolutely uh, as a matter of fact that's probably why I work as hard as I do because I'm 
I always want to make something better. Without that mm -hmm. urge, uh, life would be pretty boring for me. So mm -hmm. um, I think I set a fairly high standard. I expect a lot of myself. Do you set goals? Is there something you try to achieve each year? Yes, it's not, maybe not so palpable, but I know that I w there might be things in my performance I want to improve. And uh, mm -hmm. even in my teaching, I, I want somehow to communicate better. Uh, that's what keeps me going. How do you maintain a strong ego? You have to, somebody has to have a strong ego to be a performer, but if it's too strong, you can't stand yourself. Yes, you have to have an ego to even walk out on stage. That takes a certain amount of, uh, I would like to show you some of myself, and I assume that you're interested, <laughs> although one hopes the audience is interested. Uh, but I think too much ego for, uh, in the wrong reasons. You have to be interested in the music for itself. If you're, you know, if you have to like the art in you and not yourself in the art. If you're in love with the idea of yourself, the, the grand pianist, I think that's fairly empty uh, and, and ultimately defeating. Because, uh, and that's one thing I try to convey to my students, that the, the happy moments have to sustain you through a lot of times where you really are going to be working very hard and alone. How do you deal with the fact that sometime in your career you find out this is as high as I'm going to go? How do you deal with that? Do you really feel that's I don't want to subscribe to that idea. No, I think you can always go higher, always. If you reach a point where you feel you can't go higher, at that point are you no longer an artist? Well, no, I think if you're talking about a student that you somehow feel the student shouldn't be perhaps pursuing performance career, mm -hmm. then you gently try to dissuade him. And but it, for yourself? Uh, no, I think I'm, I'm bitten too heavily by the bug, you know. I could never give it up. Um, I would have to keep going. Okay. We're going to go out with Fascinating Rhythm. Tell us about that piece. Well, this is an elegant tune by Gershwin, of course, and uh, in his brief life, somehow, Gershwin ingested everything that embodied America, kind of a uh, buoyancy and positivism about life and love mm -hmm. and a rhythmic b vibrancy. It's all here. And this and particular version? This version is transcribed by the American pianist Earl Wilde, and uh, it's a lot of fun to play, and it has a little bit of Art Tatum and Rachmaninoff and even Liszt in it. And a little bit of Robin McCabe. I hope a little bit of Robin McCabe. It should. Let's hear it. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.